Reese, what is that track? It's I Am Woman, the anthem, the anthem of the women's liberation movement. That's because you're speaking to Unju Moon today about directing Helen Reddy's biopic, Rock On. Oh, yes, I am. Our guest today is Anju Moon, and I'm particularly excited about talking to her because she's just completed this amazing film that I haven't seen yet called I Am Woman, Helen Reddy's story. Hello, Anju. Lovely to see you. <laughs> How are things in LA at the moment under COVID? I think it's like pretty much like the rest of the world. Um, everybody's sheltering in place, as they call it in Los Angeles, and people are being safe and doing their part and, and uh, really being responsible. Good. We need that. It's such a strange time. <laughs> kind of surreal. It's kind of like if you pitch this moment as a movie script, nobody would probably believe it. Nobody I would don't... <laughs> Agree. So let's talk a little bit. The reason we wanted to talk to you was making a biopic because it's got its own sort of, it's fraught in some ways. And so we thought, what better case study than Helen Reddy? But before we get to that, I just want to um, talk to you a little bit about your early life um, in Australia and just a bit on your background. Now, you were born in South Korea. What brought you to your family to Australia and how old were you? Well, my family have a really interesting story of how they ended up in Australia. My father in the late 50s had come to RMIT in Melbourne and he'd become a wool classer, which was quite unusual for somebody from Asia to come and learn how to become a wool classer. Um, he had um, um, lived on a sheep farm, um, he was working with the shearers and he took the technology of how to develop and process wool into fabric back to Korea. Um, but those two years that he spent in Australia really had a huge impact on him and I think that he felt deeply in love with Australia and the people and when he returned home to Korea, he married my mother, they had three children, and my father at that stage was poached by various companies from all around the world. But I think his heart was very much still in Australia and, and that's what brought us back to Australia. And my father has now lived in Australia many, many years. Um, he's been the president of the, uh, the Korean Australian Association, the international president of Korean migrants all around the world. And um, he very firmly has his heart in both countries. Oh, that's a lovely story. I, I, I will class it. You're quite right. It's a completely unusual story, isn't it? Yeah. And particularly at a time when um, there was a very strong white Australia policy. What was it like growing up in Australia for you? How old were you when you came here? I was five years old when I came to Australia. And my family had just moved from Busan, which was the last Korean city that we lived in, um, which is really interesting because uh, I, I Am Woman, the film that I just did, played at the Busan Film Festival, um, which I recently went to and I took my father with me. Oh. But um, when we first moved to Australia, we, uh, we went and lived on the sheep farm that my father had, um, he, he had a very close bond with the family the Buftons, who we are still very close to. And um, when we first came to Australia, I went to um, the school, I think it's, it was in Baliang, but literally it was one of those schools where kindergarten sat in the front row and sixth grade sat in the back row. Um, <laughs> there were six rows, a grade each time. And I didn't speak English then. Um, and I remember coming to Australia and thinking how weird everybody looked with their blue eyes and their blonde hair and how everybody kind of smelled like lamb. <laughs> That's hilarious. So then um, you moved into journalism when, um, and you were at the ABC, I believe. 
what's really interesting is that when I was growing up, um, uh, even before I left Australia, um, you know, I, I'd always had a love of music and dance. And even before I left Korea, I danced in a, a, a children's dance troupe. But I grew up in a time um, when there weren't many role models for me of other, um, not just the other Asian women, but Asian men as well, who were working in the arts or in theater um, or in film. So when I was growing up, the pressure was on me um, being a really good migrant daughter to become a lawyer or a doctor. Um, and I went to law school, um, which, you know, I think was very much about being a good daughter. Yeah. Um, and while I was at law school, I, um, I had a fellow classmate who was at law school, um, Ian Colley, who is now a film producer, a, a very good film producer. But we were, he was a graduate law student. I was an undergraduate law student. And he introduced me to his brother, who was the head of children and televisions at the time, who was casting for a new um, youth program in Australia. And, um, and he decided to take me on as one of the presenters. What's it called? It was called Edge of the Wedge. Okay. And part of the reason it was a real turning point for me was um, I was still at law school while I was doing the show. And I think that it really showed me, I learned so much by doing the show. There were some wonderful director producers on the show. And when I was doing the show, I really realized that theirs was the job that I wanted. I wanted that job where I was making those creative decisions and creating and molding those stories. Um, so that show was really instrumental in clear, in, in sort of carving a path in terms of what I would go on to pursue. And you went off to afters and studied film directing? I actually studied film producing at afters. Ah. Um, and I loved it. Afters was just a really wonderful time. Um, it was a time where we could really experiment and make mistakes and watch movies. Um, we had this wonderful screen studies teacher called Kari Hane, and we watched the most incredible movies um, that we would all discuss and still in intimate detail. I also met my husband at afters. We were both young students. I really went in as a producing student, but I had a second year film um, that... Um, Peter Weir, who is one of my all-time and continues to be one of my great idols um, and is such an important influence in, in me as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, he came to teach at the school and he was going to watch the graduation films. And because my second year film had been, um, it had been uh, edited by a graduating student, he, he, he decided, well, we got it in for him to watch. Wow. Um, Was that as a dean? No. Oh, yes, it is. Peter, we were watching my film actually change my trajectory a little at film school because when he watched the films, he, he, helped, he helped and he singled out this film as a dean that I'd done. And at the time, we had a really um, wonderful head of directing who came to me and said well you know if you would like to continue and do a lot of the directing modules we would really like to support that because wow. Peter Weir had had asked us to support you as a director so that was I got very lucky with that but also um I was I was very lucky at film school I got to do both um a lot of the directing stream and and of course i fully embraced the producing stream as well yeah. he's got such an extraordinary career and off he went to the usa with with dion and we should say that dion is dion Beebe, who's one of the world's best cinematographers dops whatever the correct title is he's amazing his work isn't it he's pretty good yeah pretty good indeed <laughs> So the first, I think your first biopic was Zen of Bennett. Um, and, and so tell us a little bit about that film and how you got to make it. Well, in 
terms of biopics, I think that I'd always been, because I have a, a background in journalism, um, and, and for a time I really thought that that's what I would pursue, that I would become a journalist, not necessarily a film director. And journalism is so much about looking at real stories and shaping those real life events into narratives into narrative forms, into, um, into building evocative stories based on, um, on true stories. So that was always something in my heart. And the Zena Bennett is um, such a beautiful project. Um, it was a, a project that was um, conceived by Tony Bennett's son, Danny Bennett. And it was a real passion project for Danny. Um, Dion had worked with Danny before um, and we had gotten to know the family so that when we came together to make this film, we already had a pre-existing relationship with the Bennetts. And I think that for a project like the Zena Bennett, it was extremely important that there was a lot of trust there mm -hmm. and that Tony felt really, really comfortable. So um, the whole concept of the film from the very beginning was that you really wanted to be like a fly on the wall. Um, and you wanted to watch this process of an artist at work. Um, and you really needed to feel the intimacy of being very close to this person. Um, we did some really interesting things on the, the approach to shooting that documentary. Uh, because Tony was making his album at the time, the documentary was shot concurrently with everything that was happening with the making of the album. So quite often, I think we made like, maybe 16 music videos. And each of those music videos were shot while Tony was actually recording with those various <laughs> artists from everybody from John Mayer to Katie Lang to uh, uh, the great Aretha Franklin. We did the uh -huh. duet that Lady Gaga did with Tony Bennett. And, um, and we also did the last recording that Amy Winehouse did. Oh, that's really interesting. God, we could talk about that one all day. But I think we will move on to Helen Reddy's story because I think, you know, everybody will be fascinated to hear about that one as well. So before we get to talk about it, let's have a look at a clip that we're going to show you, the trailer for the film that will be out very soon, we hope. Oh, you must be the birthday girl. I got big plans. Oh, so have I. Oh, yeah? Uh, I'm going to make a million dollars by the time I'm 30. Well, I'm going to make two million. But uh, good for you. Keep it modest. You're from Australia, right? What are you doing in New York? If you want to make it as a singer, America is where you need to be. I'm being paid less than the band. So they're men. They've got families to feed. Well, I've got a family to feed. Tells me I have to choose between career and marriage. I tell her we can have both. <laughs> From now on, no one will tell us what we can and can't do. Miss Reddy, you sing, you sing very nicely, but male groups all the rage right now. You've heard of the Beatles, right? Did it ever occur to you men to, to ask women what they want to listen to? <laughs> Ellen, she's tapped into something here. Remember that march in New York and how many women showed up to that? Bunch of record sales marching down the street. I am a woman, hear me roar, in numbers too big to ignore. It's and kind of angry. It's man-hating. Jeff, you okay with this? What are you doing? You want to lose your recording contract? This is more than just a song to me. Thank God, because she makes everything possible. I am strong, strong. I am invincible, invincible. Looks fantastic. I mean, Helen Reddy to me is one of my icons. Um, that song for me growing up was incredibly important to me as a woman and moving, you know, through my life and career. So I'm particularly engaged by it. But how did it come about? Now, there's a great story about how you met Helen. Tell us about that. So 
Um, I met Helen at an awards dinner for that was run by Good Day LA. Um, uh, we were about to sit down and I saw a woman who I, I, she was already sitting down and I was so sure that I knew who she was, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And so I asked Jackie Weaver, who was at our table, I said, you know, who is that that everybody is hovering around? And she said, oh, she goes, Anju. She said, that's Helen Reddy. And of course, as soon as I heard that name, it gave me such a emotional response because I grew up in the 1970s. I was a very young girl. I wasn't old enough to have gone to a Helen Reddy concert, but I grew up on the North Shore of Australia. And I just know very much how her music affected the women in my life, namely my mother and her friends and that generation, who at the time were, because of the era of, um, of history and what was expected of women, most of those incredibly vibrant and intelligent women were homemakers and mothers. But when her music used to come on the radio, I had such a clear memory of how my mother and her friends would wind down the windows of their car, they'd let down their hair in the breeze, they'd sing along and they'd put their fists up in the air. And I just wanted to meet the woman who made music and spoke to women like that. Um, and so I actually managed to swap seats with my husband who was actually seated next to <laughs> Helen. And, um, and I got to have this wonderful conversation with her. And by the time dessert came around, I knew that Helen had an extraordinary, extraordinary story that I was convinced was already a film and that somebody must have made it. Um, and I was so surprised to find out that it, it hadn't been told yet. Um, and also really pleased to know that it hadn't been told because I really knew in my heart that this is a story I wanted to tell. Why did you decide to make it as a feature film rather than as a documentary? What was your thought process there? Well, Helen and I originally had talked about this being a documentary. Um, she was very keen, actually, to participate in it as a documentary. But as I got to know Helen, and, and I think that part of what I learned by doing the Zena Bennett was that you really had to become very intimate with your subject matter in, you know, if you were going to tell a real-life story. So Helen and I pretty much spent the first year just getting to know each other. We would go for walks along the beach. We would go to lunch in Santa Monica. Um, and I learned sometimes it's the smallest details that somebody tells you in a conversation that open much larger doors to their life. And I think that when I started to talk with Helen more, I realized that to tell her stories succinctly, that it was probably better as a drama. Um, and that I really felt that, um, that it would possibly help to reach more people in some way as well. Definitely. So um, I had to convince Helen, and we really had to convince Helen to turn it into uh, a work of fiction, um, you know, something that is inspired by her life. Her son, Jordan, who, um, Jordan Summers, who, was her manager at the time was really instrumental in working with me to really get her to see the value of it being a movie and the importance of it to be able to create a legacy for her and her music and her family of course um what were her concerns about it as a movie do you think well you know helen is very um very particular and she likes things to be very exact um and, you know, she was worried about how I would portray certain areas of her life, quite rightly. And, you know, when, when you sign your life rights over to somebody, at that stage, there is no script. There is no guarantee of what they're going to do with your life. So there has to be an enormous amount of trust. Um, and I think that we reached a point where Helen really started to trust um, how I was going to um, portray her and her life. I do remember saying to her, you know, I'm never going to get everything right, Helen. I'm never going to um, get every 
word that you said, right, things may not be in chronological order. I may combine certain characters, people together to make one character for ease of storytelling and for the impact of the story as well. But what I did say to her is, but I promise you that whatever I do and the final film that I make, it will always honour the spirit of who you are and what your life has been. So casting for Helen Reddy must have been, oh my goodness, where did you start? Well, casting the three lead roles um, was such a big journey because they are three figures, they're three real people who are very prominent um, in, uh, in their fields. And you could Google them at any time. Lillian Roxon, who is the third figure in the film, uh, is a rock journalist. She is an, she is an Australian who was uh, in New York. She wrote the Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll. Lillian's had a whole documentary made about her. And there are many people in Australia and in America who know who she is. Um, and of course, there's Helen and there's Jeff Wald, who has a bigger than life presence in Hollywood. Um, so I think that the the approach that I took was, you know, very much like uh, how I talked about uh, telling a biopic, which is capturing the spirit of the person, rather than really looking for somebody who's a lookalike in a way. Um, and uh, when I first saw Danielle McDonald in Patty Cakes, I just knew that she would be Lillian Roxon. Um, Danielle has um just a a feel about her and a and uh, a spirit and she'd been on this incredible journey with patty cakes and with music that i knew she could really infuse into the character of lillian roxon uh casting jeff ward was quite challenging because um it, jeff as a character you really have to walk a fine line between somebody who is dark and somebody who is charismatic and lovable um, you know, Jeff was known as one of the greatest cocaine users in the history of Hollywood. So somebody had to be able to capture that in a way that you could see from Helen Reddy's eyes of why she loved this man who was on a path to destruction. Um, and, I, and we looked at a lot of actors and I met with a couple of people and I just remember so clearly when I met Evan Peters who didn't look anything like Jeff Ward at the time. He'd just come off the set of American Horror Story. Um, and if you look at Evan and Jeff, they don't necessarily look alike, but they were able to really, Evan was really able to capture the spirit of who Jeff is. Um, and similarly with Helen, we, we did a huge search for Helen. That took over, I think we looked for more than a year and we looked in probably four or five countries. We, we examined so many different people and in the end, Amazingly, I found uh, Tilda Cobham Harvey, who is an Australian. Yes. You know, when you look at Tilda, you don't necessarily see Helen physically, but I had seen a little clip of Tilda. I, when I met her, I just felt that her life experience, even though she was very young at the time, she was only 22 when I met her, but her life experience, she, um, she, she would really be able to put that into the character. Um, she, Tilda was a, had trained in the circus. Her mother was a ballet dancer. Her father was a lighting director and she had traveled the world as a child in the way that Helen had grown up in vaudeville with parents who were in the entertainment industry. So it was really interesting casting the actors, but then what was really interesting was the process that the actors went on um, of being able to embody these characters and being able to own these characters for themselves as actors but also know that Tilda knows that you know there is a huge Helen Reddy fan base and people will go online as soon as they've watched the movie and look at her music videos so you know we were she really the actors and I we really had to walk a very fine balance between you know, the, the things that people remember about the characters, but being able to create these, these fully drawn out people on screen as well. Tilda worked incredibly, they all worked incredibly hard, but because Tilda had so much work to do, um, 
Tilda had never sung before, so she had to learn to sing. She had to learn to move like Helen. She had movement classes. We worked on her voice. We worked on breathing. Um, she's an incredibly, incredibly dedicated actor. Wow. She was able to, she, she had almost, I think she had more than five weeks rehearsals, which is a long time in an independent film. And it's obviously crucial. And I can see why the search would have taken so long. But that's fascinating. I said, I said to Tilda, I think the biggest compliment you've had, Tilda, is that when Jeff Wald watched the film, this is Helen's ex-husband, that at times he said to me that he thought he was watching Helen. <gasps> wow, you could ask for no better. Did it put a lot of pressure on you as a director, knowing that you had become close to Helen and that you were very respecting of her story? Um, yes. And that, that moment was really, uh, it really came to light when I had to show her an edit of the movie. So, um, and I think that when you're, when you're in the trenches of making a film and um, especially in Australia where, you know, the resources can be more limited, um, you know, you're so busy trying to get that story on the screen and to be able to um, do every, all the details required of actually getting to your edit that it was only when I actually had the film up in front of Helen, I suddenly... I think the enormity of the weight of the responsibility of knowing that whatever I had told would impact not only her, but her family. Um, that was the moment that it really, really hit me, I think. How did she respond? Um, you know, apart from the fact that I started to um, sweat profusely during the middle of the screening um, and started to worry, uh, I suddenly, in my fear realized that Helen was singing along to the songs and that made me feel so much better um and there was one moment in the film where she got really she got upset at something that had happened in the movie and I thought that she was really unhappy with the way I treated that um that moment of her life but then I realized that she was actually responding to the movie she was so upset at what had happened in the movie and she was so with the story um and she really was able to watch it as a story as well. But at the very end of the film, um, when the last card came up, Helen read a lot of those, um, those cards out aloud. And, when, and at the end, of, at the very last card, Helen started crying. And it was incredibly, incredibly moving. Rosemary Blight, the producer and I were both there and we were, everybody was in tears and I don't think Helen was sad and I think her family would agree with me that it was a release for Helen. It was, it was almost like a cathartic release for her having seen this story of her life and, and she, you know, hugged her children and she hugged me. And then I knew in that moment that it was okay to keep proceeding with the film. Rosemary and I had discussed how important it was to, you know, we, we, it's not like we needed permission from the family, but we wanted to keep the family involved. Um, so at every stage, you know, we would try to involve the family, um, you know, and give them the opportunity to see what we were making so that at the end, by the time the film was released, there were no surprises for them. Would you have made any changes at any point had they said, no, 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 you just can't? Because as you say, you've got, you've got the rights. It's, it's yours to, to do as you wish in a sense. Um, I think we had the kind of relationship um, with Helen and her children and, and also with her ex-husband, Jeff Wald, who is a very key character in the movie. And to be really honest, Jeff was the person I was the most nervous about because Jeff um, would totally agree that he uh, speaks his mind. Um, Jeff, there is no, everything is black and white with Jeff and there is no BSing with Jeff. So um, I'm, I, whenever Jeff has been upset about anything, he ha he's called me immediately. I always say that the only two, you know, people that I, uh, like if I see 
Jeff Ward's name come up on the phone or my father's, by the way, <laughs> I would answer those phone calls. <laughs> so when you ask me, um, you know, about, you know, if people had asked for changes along the way, when we, uh, I think that Jeff had the chance to read the script before the film started and he saw the edit and there were, you know, one or two concerns that Jeff had brought up. Um, but I think that most of the time we had such strong dialogue and he really understood the film that I was going to make. And I think that's your responsibility as the director is you have to be really able to explain to everybody, not just your cast and crew, but in this case, in a biopic, to the people and the families that it, the family that it's going to impact, what your vision is and, and why it's going to work. In the end, I think the family have all felt, and Jeff, who is not necessarily painted in, I mean, he's painted in reality. So, you know, there is good and bad to Jeff in the story. Um, in many ways, he's the antagonist of the film. But Jeff has fully supported the film um, because he really thinks the film is good and he thinks oh, that he did a good job with telling the story. Plus also, I think a part of me thinks that, that Jeff also is still, after all these years and after, you know, devastating the devastating divorce that they had and the fact that they didn't speak for years, he's still supporting Helen and her career. Um, you talked about the need for really good communication with people. What are the other tips that you have about making a biopic? Well, I think that one of the, the really important things to consider when you're thinking of making a biopic is to really examine what is the journey of the story. So, you know, I have to say that before I met Helen, I had looked at a couple of different people um, and, you know, people had approached me about doing stories about their lives and some of them were music industry orientated as well. Um, but even though I love the music and I love the era, I couldn't find enough of a journey in the story. So I think that regardless of whether it's a documentary or if it's a work of fiction, I think that storytellers, you need to take an audience on a journey. Um, and that journey needs to develop and grow um, with your subject matter. And sometimes the fact that somebody has one hit song or is, um, or is somebody famous just might not be enough. Um, because I think that people go to see storytelling, whether it's documentaries or drama, because they want to be moved. They want to be, uh, you know, they want to feel something emotional. They want to learn something um, about themselves. That's terrific advice. Thank you so much. Look, I think we're going to leave it there. It's just been such a pleasure to talk to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It was such a joy to make this film about Helen. Um, and I really hope that everybody gets to see it soon. It's, it's you know, with the current situation, um, you know, hopefully cinemas will be back bigger and brighter than they were before. The sooner the better, that's all I can say. <laughs> So that's it from us for this week. Thank you so much again to Andrew Moon and also to Acme for being such amazing partners in this. If you want to know more about what we do, it's mediamentors.com.au and we'll see you next time. <laughs>